Hi, my name is Peter Weiss. Uh, this clip is on energy requirements in disease and is part of the lecture on energy improvement requirements in health and disease. So how do we uh, approach energy requirements of the patient? First, we usually base it on the resting energy expenditure, which we can estimate or measure. Then we need a physical activity level uh, to complement that. And then the question is whether we need extra energy for the patient for disease. Now, Resting energy expenditure can be measured by indirect calorimetry and more and more this is applied in uh, the clinical situation. However, uh, classically we uh, need a fairly um, expensive apparatus to, to do that. However, the advantage is that the actual energy expenditure of this patient is being measured and the current uh, conditions. So uh, it is very important, especially in disease, to have measures available since the uh, estimates from healthy, based on healthy subjects, are actually not applying to this patient. However, the disadvantage is that uh, it takes uh, quite a lot of work and time um, and the different circumstances uh, may affect the measurement so you, you need some expertise to do it uh, in the right way um, and it doesn't provide you the total energy expenditure. I must say there is some uh, a new machine on the market which we hope it makes uh, some of it uh, easier uh, to perform but most of these uh, disadvantages will still be uh, applying. Now, the alternative to the measurement is the estimation uh, with equations. And, well, uh, it's a simple approach. So the advantage is that it's simple and practical. So we actually do it. However, the disadvantage is that all these equations are population specific. They do not provide the total energy expenditure, so you still need some extra uh, level uh, to, to add to the equation and does not represent normal clinical variation. So you don't actually predict, predict this specific patient under these specific uh, uh, circumstances at this moment. So uh, we have some advantages and disadvantages. So what we normally see in, uh, in the clinic, um, and this is an example for elderly patients, that there is a large variation, and you can see that here in the flattened curve. Um, so we have uh, some larger uh, measurements and some rather low values of energy expenditure. But if you estimate the same group with uh, an equation, um, then it appears that there is a much smaller range of uh, values. Um, so they give a very steep curve. However, it remains to be seen whether the estimated resting energy expenditures then also apply to these measured values in these patients. So this is a problem that we need to tackle in clinical practice. So uh, we've done some work on this. Um, this is a range from 2008. And this is a new one from 2016, which I will share some values from. Um, in this picture, you can see uh, energy expenditure uh, as expressed in kcals per day on the left side and kcals per kg per day on the right side, on the right axis, uh, for inpatients and outpatients. And what you can see is that uh, the resting energy expenditure is actually uh, in blue, 
is actually not that different for the patient. However, uh, per kg body weight, um, the energy expenditure for inpatients is somewhat higher than uh, for outpatients per kg body weight. Um, they are in general somewhat lighter, so then the total energy expenditure uh, is the same. Now we have to think about how uh, this comes about and this can be due to disease, that's a possibility. However, we have to also uh, understand that body composition of these patients is different. So the inpatients uh, have a higher level of malnutrition, therefore the contribution of the organs to the total energy expenditure is higher and this makes the resting energy expenditure in kcals per kg higher. So what you can see here is the same values, however distributed uh, between four levels of uh, BMI. And uh, here you can see that the underweight patients, the malnourished patients, have a rather large uh, energy expenditure per kg body weight while the high uh, BMI group doesn't actually. So, um, and this is, um, as I just explained, uh, probably largely due to the contribution of uh, the organs to the energy expenditure and not uh, all uh, related to the level of disease. Uh, this is the uh, earlier uh, evaluation of uh, energy prediction equations. So there's a whole range of equations. Uh, we compare them to the measured values and what you can see in the red line that basically all measurements that about 50% of patients can be predicted accurately, which means that the value of the estimate is within minus 10 to plus 10 percent of the measured value and this is true for most of the equations even the best ones and there are some worse equations um, when you look at this picture you see on the in the y-axis uh, the 100 percent level this means that uh, even uh, the best equations here the uh, FAO WHO equation and Harris Benedict in the adapted version from 1984 are under predicting uh, the level of the measured value for the patients and most other uh, equations are even worse. What you can also see is that if you use a fixed factor and it doesn't even matter which factor you use you, you, you will see large descript discrepancies uh, between uh, groups of patients um, and we have to be very careful to base that on just weight and you can see that the underweight patients actually are underpredicted quite a lot. Now the next factor is in fact the uh, physical activity level so uh, uh, energy expenditure is always based on uh, resting energy expenditure plus a certain level for physical activity. Um, and here are some factors that are applying for healthy people. Um, so what we have to use is, for instance, 1.5 or 1.7. Uh, times the basal metabolic rate or resting energy expenditure. There is some research, not a lot. Uh, this is on all the study, but a, a quite a nice summary of data measurements that have been performed in chronic disease. And what you can see at the y-axis is the physical activity um, level as percentage of the total energy expenditure. And on the x-axis you see the age. With age you can see that there is a decrease 
uh, in the portion that physical activity uh, is from total uh, energy expenditure. However, the main message is uh, that um, in chronic disease um, there is a lower level of physical activity as part of the total energy expenditure, uh, which doesn't make it 30% but 20%. When you look at physical activity in acute disease, uh, there are very large differences to be observed, but for critical illness uh, some years ago, we have um, selected 10% as the level of physical activity for bedridden critically ill patients. So um, we may uh, use these uh, levels, so healthy people may have 30% of their total energy expenditure uh, to be um, used for physical activity, which gives it a physical activity level of 1.5. For acute and chronic disease, we very often use 1.3, um, and for critical, critical illness, we did use 1.1, but uh, after uh, careful consideration, um, we have uh, deleted this extra level of energy because uh, the physical activity of critical ill patients is very, very low. Um, and uh, too much energy can actually harm the patient here. So this is just a general uh, approximation. Here you can see a, uh, a large variation in disease or um, um, well extreme situations like burn burns um, result in very high energy expenditures. We know that. And these um, I would exclude from a general measure because uh, they need a very specific uh, approach. Also, severe sepsis is, I think, we should exclude because um, this can be uh, result in very high energy expenditures. Uh, and this might not directly relate to the level of nutrition we have to give. Then, um, if we summarize the the patients, then I think a lot of patients will fall within the range plus 20% um, uh, of basal metabolic rate is uh, an extra energy expenditure that is based on the disease level. Um, also, in time, obviously, uh, energy expenditure can develop, will develop, in fact. And what we often see is that there might be a short-term increase in energy expenditure, but uh, that may uh, be gone quite quickly. For major burns, again, this is very exceptional, so we will exclude that occasion. But most patients will actually only have a temporary small increase uh, in resting energy expenditures. So uh, in most cases, it's not that dramatic. Uh, this is a fairly complicated uh, picture that Ilya has drawn here. On the X axis, we see the disease severity. So 1.0 is no disease and 1.7 is a very high level of disease and on the y-axis we can see the physical activity level again um, going from 1.0 no activity to 1.8 so if we take patient A there is no disease and a physical activity level of 1.5 patient B is ill uh, has a disease level of 1.2 and now the question is what level of energy expenditure would we uh, ascribe to this patient and uh, we think that for most patients uh, a, an extra level of energy of 30% would actually on top of resting energy expenditure would actually be uh, 
complying with this picture, which actually means that that by increasing the disease level, the level of physical activity is being decreased up to a certain point, which is about uh, the level of patient B, and above that, then it becomes a bit more difficult. Uh, we could call the uh, patient C with severe disease, um, and in severe disease, uh, it's extremely difficult to predict the energy level, so it would be highly recommended to measure the energy expenditure of this patient by indirect calorimetry. Another point I like to make, um, the reference you can't read anymore, by Frepon and Pryzer. Um, and this is a, a picture that is uh, made based on um, the findings in critically ill patients, where they have uh, looked at day one, two, three, four, five, and classically it appears that it's very hard to feed patients at a level that is being the required energy expenditure even if you measure it. They call this the caloric debt. However, in these uh, acutely ill patients, metabolism is uh, out of order quite a bit and is producing a level of non-inhibitable endogenous energy supply. Here you can see that in the light blue bars. And especially in the first days, this can be a remarkably high level of energy that is produced from endogenous sources, mainly gluconeogenesis. Uh, and this means that the external and exogenous energy supply has to be decreased. So uh, the blue uh, small bar here is actually not associated with a caloric deficit as in the upper panel, but is actually associated with uh, adequate energy feeding if you account for the endogenous energy supply. The only problem here is that we don't know the quantity of this endogenous energy supply so therefore, this uh, is a problem in clinical practice that we have to guess. And therefore, uh, the recommendation is to energy underfeed. So to not start energy feeding too fast. And this picture also looks a bit complicated, but eucaloric means that they, uh, uh, the patients got their the energy that they needed. Hypercaloric means that they uh, received 80% of the energy that they needed. AMP stands for ambulant, so they were walking, and BR stands for backrest. This means that the net protein deposition of these patients is lower during backrest, that is quite clear, uh, and in fact, in the hypercalorically fed patients, uh, but ambulant, the uh, net protein deposition was a bit better. Uh, so it appears that uh, slight energy underfeeding might be beneficial, while uh, resting in bed is in fact not. But we'll come back to this issue on protein requirements. Uh, and here you can see from the same study that a bed rest actually results in a, quite a large uh, a loss of lean mass in the hypercaloric uh, state. So in that sense, it, it's, it is actually not very productive. So we have to understand what the caloric requirement of the patient is. Now here you can see that um, the relationship with moderate uh, high energy balance, this means that the energy balance 
has resulted in fat accumulation in the patient. Not extreme levels, but here it's about two kilograms in a period of five weeks. So that's still quite a lot, I think. While low energy balance, LEB, stands for actually being in balance. And what you can see is two uh, values. The BIA, the bioelectrical impedance analysis, has been used to show a, uh, the loss of fat-free mass which is a lot higher in the high energy balance group and if you use ultrasound um, to measure uh, muscle um, uh, level then um, with the red spots you can see that again in the high energy balance group there is more muscle lost in five weeks in these patients when the energy uh, supply was too high. So there is actually a relationship between energy oversupply and uh, lean body mass. And uh, additional to that, a greater muscle atrophy, as I just explained, and with activation of systemic inflammation and of antioxidant defenses. So uh, energy oversupply can really be harmful for the patient. So the conclusion for this part is that most patients with increased resting energy expenditure during disease will have decreased physical activity and a total normal energy expenditure. So the total expenditure and therefore energy requirement is not different. Both energy underfeeding and energy overfeeding are associated with worse outcome. So both situations are not desired in patients. Therefore, the measurement of energy expenditure is preferred over estimation, but in clinical practice, that is very often not possible. And just as a last reminder for estimating um, energy requirements with, in this case, the Harris-Benedict, the adjusted version, you can see that if we use uh, ideal body weight in the equation, then the level of underestimation is very high. If we use the current level of body weight, then the accurate estimations are the highest. And in between, if we use adjustments of body weight, uh, the res results for the accurate estimations is intermediate and what we can actually see and conclude and uh, to the right side this is uh, seen per BMI group that current rate actually provides better estimations than uh, any of the other adjusted body weights. Okay thank you and hope you've enjoyed this.